welcome to the show. Now, Republican candidate Donald Trump and my first guest share a political relationship rooted in their appeal to populist conservative voters and an anti-establishment rhetoric. She was an early supporter of Trump during his 2016 presidential campaign, endorsing him at a critical time when many Republican leaders were hesitant to back his candidacy. Her backing helped legitimise him among grassroots conservatives and Tea Party supporters, many of whom had supported her during her own political rise. In return, Trump praised her for her influence on the conservative movement, crediting her with energising the Republican base. Despite not being heavily involved in Trump's administration, she's remained a vocal supporter of his policies and presidency, and their relationship's been marked by mutual admiration with both continuing to resonate with the populist wing of the Republican Party. I'm joined now by the former governor of Alaska and Republican vice president nominee, Sarah Palin. Great to see you. And I know this might seem like old hat because it's a few days ago now, the debate, but people still mulling it over. So let's just start with your thoughts on how it went, especially for Trump. Yes, thank you so much, Rosanna. And I really appreciate you having me on because it seems like a lot of the mainstream media here in the US, they don't want to hear a whole lot of truth telling. They don't want someone who's going to be candid and blunt and calls it like they see it, which I will do. So thank you for having me on. Yes, it's hard to even define what that show was the other night as a debate, because traditionally a debate is where moderators are unbiased and they let both um, parties speak and, and articulate their vision, their idea, their experience. And we didn't see that the other night. So again, hard to define it as a debate. Really, it was a three-on-one pre-planned presage where one candidate, Kamala, she was um, she was really uh, touched with kid gloves, and the other candidate, Donald Trump, was he held to the fire. Um, a lot of fact checking that turned out to be two days later. A lot of untruthful fact checking. So tough for the audience to really uh, be educated on what both candidates' positions are and their vision for this country and for the world. Well, let me uh, respond by saying thank you for being candid. Thank you for being honest. That's exactly what we do want, and it's why we're speaking to you. And we appreciate that honesty in terms of your views. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go into some of the policy points of the uh, contenders for the White House. But in terms of the fact-checking, I just want to ask why you think Donald Trump was fact-checked more than Harris. You're, you're claiming here that there, you felt there was bias from the ABC moderators. Uh, why do you think it happened? I think it's, it's very obvious over here in the U.S. that our mainstream media is quite liberal and they would love to see a puppet like Kamala Harris be elected, somebody who is actually uh, controlled not by her, her own convictions and her own experience and her own vision for this country and for the world, but for um, globalists, really um, not just socialists, but communists who want to control the people. And Kamala Harris is willing to be that person, as Joe Biden had been that person for a bit there. And uh, Donald Trump, well, he's much more independent and he um, has proven that he is for the people. He wants to be elected by the people. Nobody owns him. Nobody's going to control him. And that's why the mainstream media has such a problem with a lot of conservatives and independents, including Donald Trump. So the moderators, the network that hosted that quote unquote debate, um, it, it, it's pretty obvious why it is that they would like to see Kamala Harris elected. And as I, as I say, Rosanna, we're going beyond socialism even here with the positions that are being taken by Kamala Harris and by those who are controlling her and her message. And um, we're going to head into communism here in America if things don't go the right way in this upcoming election. Well, you've said so many things there I want to ask you about. So let's talk about the, the puppet idea um, or, or what you're asserting is reality there of Harris being the puppet and pe being controlled from behind by people with a globalist agenda, a socialist agenda, a communist agenda. Um, if that is the case, when did that start happening, do you think, in the White House? Well, I think for decades there have been the, the uniparty, the globalists who want to control the people and take away individual rights 
Uh, but it's been really made manifest much more aggressively and clearly as of late with um, a, a candidate like Kamala, who, remember, she has never won a primary. She's never had to really show her medal and show what it is as uh, convictions, internal convictions about what she believes in, about um, what she has done via her experience, her background, to put her in a position of being educated and informed and prepared to be the leader of the free world. She hasn't had to do any of that. So she's been a convenient pick for the globalists who do want to control the people. She's been a convenient mouthpiece for them as of late. So it's really been a more aggressive and more clear of just uh, in the last couple of years. Uh, I'll come back to the globalist piece because I think it's particularly interesting uh, when we think about foreign policy, which you have a big uh, career in. Um, so I will come back to that. But I just want to pick up on the point that you described Donald Trump there just previously as an independent within the realm of conservatives. Um, talk to me about that. Do you consider him to be sort of outside the Republican Party almost, even though he is running as a Republican contender? Yes, and that's a really good question. Um, and uh, once in a while, I'm asked that question also as how I can be a, a Republican and yet be so far removed from the Republican establishment, the mechanism to the machine that actually runs the Republican Party nationally, and in my case, in the state of Alaska, um, where people are so obsessed with partisanship and with labels and with positions within the party that they let partisanship get in the way of just doing what's right for the people. Well, Donald Trump has never been a part of that. Remember, he had been a Democrat for many years and um, quite independent, but recognized that it's the Republican platform that is best for America in order for our our ability to perpetuate the blessings that we have today. We don't want to lose those um, for generations to come. So it's the Republican platform that is best, that makes the most sense for the people. So Donald Trump recognized that, jumps on board in the Republican Party, and has gone forth. So he does butt heads, as do I, with many in the Republican Party. And that, um, by definition, would make us uh, much more independent. We're not bought or sold. Um, nobody owns us. We can just do what's right via the Constitution, that blueprint towards a more perfect union. We get to follow that with that internal conviction that what we're doing is right for the people. And should you be operating under a different label then or, or amongst a different party? You're saying we then, so I assume you mean people like yourself. You've clearly um, publicly endorsed Donald Trump for both election campaigns, for all of his election campaigns. I mean... I'm talking here about Republicans turning against Trump, the Cheneys most notably in recent days, former Vice President Dick Cheney, his daughter, as well as many other influential Republicans. So what are we seeing here? Is there even a Republican party as we recognize it anymore? Another good question, Rosanna, because there was a lot of talk about the need for a third party, for uh, more independent Americans who traditionally perhaps had been registered as Democrats or Republicans, but are just sick of the partisanship, getting in the way of just doing what's right and allowing people to have freedom and government trusting the people to make their own decisions. We make decisions better than faceless, nameless bureaucrats in some far off bubble in Washington, DC. They need to trust the people. So. Uh, quite often, neither party represents that. Certainly, the Democrats do not represent that. They're very blatant and bold now about taking away individual rights and freedom from Americans. At least the Republican Party, our platform, still sticks to that conviction. But that's a good question because there is a lot of talk about the need for a third party, more independent. Now, you mentioned a few of the high-profile Republicans who aren't supporting Donald Trump. Uh, recently, Drudge, the Drudge Report, came out with a headline saying, Palin, I am the only living GOP nominee for the higher office to be supporting Trump. And I look back and I thought, well, they're, they're right. Well, these others who aren't supporting Donald Trump, when you look back at their history and what it is they really stand for, they didn't necessarily stand on the planks in the Republican platform. I, I did. I do. And that's why it's been easy for me to um, endorse, to support the one candidate who remembers what being an American is all about and, and the freedom that we cherish. So um, you point that out, and that's very accurate, that, um, no, some high-profile Republicans, they, they don't support Donald Trump, but that's okay because there are a whole lot of independents, many Democrats leaving their party, knowing that, well, essentially, it's the Democrat Party who have left them, and 
they're just seeking that freedom, that experience that's needed to be the leader of the free world. And they see that in Donald Trump. A lot of uh, the Republicans that have turned away the more traditional GOP party members in the last few months have talked about uh, Trump's rhetoric, turning them off, basically. They can't get behind a man who says quite sensationalist things. It's no secret. He's been doing it for years. Let's talk about what he said in the debate, for example. I know you're probably uh, sick to death of hearing it. It's been all the headlines. But um, residents of Springfield having their cats and dogs eaten by immigrants, that was the big takeaway line. Was it a distraction that he said that? away from immigration policy? No, because this morning there are reports of Haitian immigrants um, and illegal immigrants who uh, culturally it's okay for them to eat a cat or a dog. And, and they're seeing reports now that are proving that, that Trump wouldn't have said that had he not uh, known that there were some facts there but behind that quote-unquote rhetoric. It wasn't rhetoric. It, it was a fact. But what we refer to over here, Rosanna, when people talk about that Trump rhetoric, you know, we we, we like to kind of the running joke, the, the verbiage we use as well, those mean tweets of Donald Trump. You know what? I'll take a mean tweet over a failed policy, uh, the control of the people, all those parts of that globalist uniparty agenda that Kamala Harris represents. I'll take a mean tweet over that any day. Now, in the debate, yeah, there is some talk now about, oh, Trump had some rhetoric here or there that some people maybe felt uncomfortable hearing. I felt uncomfortable hearing the lies coming from Kamala Harris. She said lie after lie, and she was not held to account. And that's a shame because the people here, we want to do our own homework. We want to have information so that we can to our, the best of our ability, know who it is who is offering themselves up in the name of service. So we do have the best leader that we can elect. Now, Kamala Harris, uh, you've probably seen the bullet points of all the lies that she spewed. She said um, just recently, she's against fracking. She's against that resource development that we need to be energy independent in, in America. And then in the debate, you know, she, she denies that. She said, oh, nobody... There's no state in America that is conducting abortions up until birth. Uh, yeah, there are. There are six or seven states that allow zero gestational age to be considered with abortion. So she lied on that. Um, she lied about uh, the unvetted illegal aliens coming over our border, our open border, and how that adversely affects our economies, um, our culture. She lied about her role in that. So it's been lie after lie. I would rather hear a mean tweet, again, over a lie being spewed from a candidate. In, in Back in 2011, uh, you said it's time that a woman is president of the United States of America. Of course, you had your own run uh, at high office. You, you, had, you were governor of Alaska. You've held many high positions. But the U.S. still hasn't had a woman as president. It's clear you don't think Harris is that woman. No, um, doggone it. You know, I do. I would love to see a woman president in the U.S. And it, it, it can't be Kamala Harris. No, she's ill-equipped. She's not qualified and uh, very ill-prepared. So, no, she should not be our first female president. And, and that's what I mean when I refer to the debate, quote-unquote, debate the other night, where one candidate was uh, touched with kid gloves and the other one, there was harsher treatment of him. Unfortunately, it was the female candidate whom... I believe people thought, oh, you know, you got to kind of back off. Don't hold her to account. Um, be nice to her because, uh, unfortunately, you know, she she likes to play the victim even when it comes to gender. And that's unfortunate. I want a strong woman. Americans want a strong woman if we're going to have one as uh, the first female president. Someone who is experienced. Someone who understands the administrative role that is the presidency. And um, someone who... Um, is, is just bound by that constitution and will stick to it and not let other people tell her what to do if it goes against our constitution. That's not Kamala Harris. Can you see any of those women in the Republican Party? Why haven't those contenders been uh, put up for election? Well, I think uh, now is the time for more uh, female candidates to uh, really rise up, if you will, and uh, allow what it is that they have done via experience and and um, their their vision for our country to be articulated and to be understood. Now is the time for female candidates all over the world, I wish. You know, I, I hope um, that perspective that perhaps a female could bring to the office of presidency or any of these other high offices. And um, 
you know, I, I look forward to that time because Americans are ready for that. People like me, where we've grown up in a place here in Alaska, Rosanna, where gender isn't an issue. You know, the, the females, the women, the girls, we're expected to work as hard as the guys. We're expected to um, provide for our families, literally, even practically speaking, like, because we live off the grid quite often. We get kicked off the grid. So making sure that we have energy supplies ourselves, the women do it, making sure that we can harvest our own protein to feed our own families. It hasn't been like a man's role to do that. It's, it's been, um, hey, anybody, anybody willing to do it in order to survive in less than ideal conditions, you got to do it. So I'm fortunate that I have grown up in a family, in a community, in a state where gender hasn't been an issue. Look, uh, Sarah Palin, you've been very generous with your answers. It's been great speaking to you. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Appreciate you. The immigration debate in the U.S. has been a heated issue, particularly during and after Donald Trump's presidency. Trump's administration taking a hardline stance on the topic, advocating for stricter border controls, the building of a wall and policies that incorporated family separation. During recent political debates, Trump has criticized the more recent Biden administration's handling of immigration, calling it weak and ineffective. In response, Democrat candidate and current Vice President Kamala Harris has defended the administration, pointing to efforts to address root causes of migration, enhance border security and reform the immigration system in a more humane way. Now, this does continue to be a central point of contention in U.S. politics, with more and more Americans wanting to see immigration decreased than a year ago. Research from consultancy Gallup finding 55% of U.S. adults said there should be less foot traffic entering the country, up from 41% a year ago. This includes voters from even the most traditionally liberal cities like New York, where hundreds of thousands of migrants have been sent by Republican-led border states tired of being on the front lines of the crisis. And as Sally Patson reports, some are beginning to lose patience. The American dream has for centuries lured migrants to these fair shores. But lately, it hasn't been the fairy tale they had hoped for. Unable to work legally because they're undocumented and evicted from city shelters after 60 days max, many line the pavements day in, day out. Earlier this year, two mega shelters opened up here in Brooklyn's trendy Clinton Hill. People started coming into this cafe asking for work, free food or to charge their phones. Since then, a spate of stabbings and shootings has prompted protest from some locals. You put 3,000 people uh, in a place with not enough room, no air, little food, no middle of July summer. Yeah, it's, it, things are going to get violent. This liberal blue state has long welcomed migrants with open arms but New York's administration has now changed its tune. We are past our breaking point. New Yorkers' compassion may be limitless, but our resources are not. Mayor Eric Adams blames that lack of resources on the Biden administration, which in turn blames the Republicans for blocking border control funding. And the Republicans say they'll tackle the crisis head on. The Republican platform promises to launch the largest deportation operation in the history of our country. That promise is resonating with voters concerned about the crime and overcrowding on their doorsteps. More than 200,000 migrants have arrived here in New York City since spring 2022, according to August figures. And though there's sympathy from locals here, there's frustration too, with many of New York's oldest residents demanding a plan of action to deal with the city's newest ones. Yet campaigners like Ilza Thielman say that frustration is misdirected. It's always um, a very useful tool to demonize the other, right? People who are coming here are far, actually far less likely to commit crimes. But you see one or two instances, and that's amplified by the press, amplified by p politicians who think they can gain from it, and that becomes the mindset of the public. She accuses politicians of using immigration as a political football. It could, though, help score the deciding point in November's presidential election. Sally Patterson, Al Arabiya English, New York.
Well, let's get reaction to that issue that's dominating this election with the longtime friend of the Biden family and Democratic National Convention superdelegate in California, Bob Mulholland. And Gary Brugman joining us as well. He's a former U.S. Border Patrol agent who was pardoned by Donald Trump after he was sent to prison for almost two years for violating the civil rights of a man attempting to cross the U.S. border into Texas. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us on this issue. And as you know, we broadcast to an international audience here. So I'm going to ask very simply to start, Bob, if you can give us a sense of what is the reality of this issue, migrant issue, in the U.S. at the moment. Well, I... Um... I think it's just one issue. Uh, for us Democrats, we'll focus on reproductive rights. It's the number one issue for women under 45. And during Trump's four years, millions of uh, migrants came to the border, and that's been the case for decades. And we had an opportunity, um, the Republicans and Democrats in Congress, come up with a new solution, 1,500 more border guards. And what did Trump say? No. Do not pass that bill. I want millions more coming to our border and invading our country. That's Trump's position. It was the political position, and it's the wrong position. And some of those people that, that Trump encouraged to come in, he'll later attack for committing a crime. But I think once we get this election over, Harris reelect, Harris elected, then uh, Congress will, will deal with it, and, and, and Trump will probably be on his way to jail with no pardon possibility. So it's one issue, but it's an issue that's been around for decades and probably be around for decades. But I'll say, I'll add this. Any Ukrainian man that comes to the American border asking for asylum, I'd put him on a plane back to Ukraine to join the military to serve the country he loves. I'm tired of hearing about Ukrainian men avoiding the draft for the country they love. Interesting. Well, you've given us a lot to discuss there, Bob. I will come back to you. I want to talk to you particularly about Harris's policy points on migration. But let's cross to Gary as well and just get his take on the reality of the migrant situation in the US. You obviously have vast experience there on the border. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, I want to thank Bob for his service. He was 104th, 101st Airborne, I believe. And um, that, that's a great thing yeah. back in Vietnam days. Um, I was in the Coast Guard myself, but the migrant situation right now is just out of control. You know, under Trump, we had the safest border that we had. He had Title 42 in place, the return to Mexico policy. I mean, the borders were secure, and not only were the borders secure, the, the en encounters and apprehensions were at a minimum, and the Border Patrol actually had the highest morale that they had in a long time. The morale of the Border Patrol right now is, is in the dirt. They're not allowed to do their jobs. They got their hands tied. I mean, it's it's not what they swore an oath to do, is you know the job that they're doing now, and this whole uh, migrant situation that we have right now is just a big burden on everything that we got in this country. It's a burden on city budgets, education, police, fire, EMS, as well as the quality of life, you know, for residents. You know, it's just insane what's going on right now, and it needs to be it needs to be stopped. Um, that is, you know, it's the reality of migration everywhere, that picture you're painting, Gary. Bob, I'll come back to you on that, which is, uh, you know, migrant crises, as they're being called around the world. It's been an issue that's dogged uh, Europe, the UK, uh, various parts of um, the world in recent years, and people saying it does take away from livelihoods, takes away from jobs, there are safety issues. Do you think these are all fair and rational concerns when it comes to people crossing borders? I, yeah, I'm glad you mentioned I, Europe. You know, if we had not invaded Afghanistan or stayed there for 20 years, Syria, Libya, much of this problem, at least in Europe, from Africa, would not have been happening. But unfortunately, with 21st century technology, the whole world can see, oh, look at this. There's farm worker op options in America or farm worker options in Spain. And that's what drives this. And of course, I can speak from the American point of view, probably well over half of our farm workers in California, and we're the big red basket of America, are undocumented. And these farmers tend to be Republicans. And they'll, on the one hand, say they're supporting Trump, and on the other hand, make sure they have a lot of undocumented to uh, uh, harvest the crops, which Americans, you know, 340 million of us uh, 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 eat. But I, I think... Um, uh, Gary made a point, which is, yeah, we need more border guards, and I wish Trump would not have stopped the bill from being passed. We could have moved forward. We could be hiring these people today. But Trump made a political decision and ordered the Republicans in Congress, 
many of them very conservative Republicans who had worked months on the bill. And But again, uh, after November 5th, we'll get this problem moving forward to help solve it. But we'll never stop people trying to get in. Uh, to any country that has a developed uh, currency, developed world, whether it's Europe or in, um, you know, even in Asia, some countries are having uh, migrant problems. So it's a world that we live in and we got to uh, do the best we can. Gary, just coming to you on uh, Bob's comments there about Trump and border guards. Do you think, uh, do you agree? Uh, with what Bob is suggesting there, that, that, that Trump basically failed on the issue of getting more guards there on the border? No, no, I don't agree at all. Um, that particular bill that Bob's talking about, Trump turned it down because it had it, it was actually a border bill. Yes, it was, but it had very little money actually going to border prevention. It had a lot of more mo it had a lot more money going towards Planned Parenthood and going towards a, a lot of other pork that had nothing to do with the border. And you know, myself being a border patrol agent, we've got o almost 20,000 20, border patrol agents. And we don't need any more Border Patrol agents. What we need is to untie them and let the Border Patrol agents we have enforce the laws that are on the books, all right? Stop letting these mass people, this catch and release. Stop bringing people with CBP-1. That CBP-1 CBP app, all they're doing is bringing people in across the bridge. They say apprehensions are down on the, uh, on, on the border because, you know, people ain't crossing as much because they're coming in through the bridge because they've just rerouted them. It's all a numbers game is all it is. And um, and if, if if they really want 1,500 new Border Patrol agents, then why haven't they put them in place already in the past three and a half years, if that if that's such a big thing? You know, I mean, the, the agents we have now can shut down the border if they were allowed to enforce the laws that we have on the books. It's that plain and simple. Interesting. Bob, uh, allowing you to come back on that, why haven't the Democrats done this? Well, Congress, under our Constitution, is required to pass a bill to fund things. I mean, I, I find it interesting. Gary said, well, why don't we just hire the 1,500? Well, like any city in America, we'll just hire 1,500 police officers. Well, you got to fund it. you got to budget. you got to pass a law. We're not a dictatorship. And um, I think uh, most Americans, uh, when they heard about the bill, vast majority of them supported it. And again, it was an Oklahoma U.S. Senator Republican who spent months and in the end, Trump humiliated them. And there was no reason for that. We could have gotten ahead of this issue rather than keep dragging this issue down. But I will remind uh, your listeners, this is not a dominant issue with the American voters overall, especially in the swing areas of Pennsylvania, my home state, Wisconsin, Michigan. Other issues, the economy tends to be the number one issue. And as long as the economy remains expanding and stable for the next few months, I think Harris wins, and her focus in that debate the other night on personal stories about women, when Trump was bragging about, oh, everybody wanted Roe v. Wade overturned. Well, nobody wanted over Roe v. Wade overturned except about 15% of the American people. And she looks good on TV. He looks like kind of like an old man heading to a nursing home. And let's face the facts. If Trump was back in his fourth year, he'd be in his mid-80s. And remember what Trump said about Biden being in his mid-80s. Well, guess what? Trump is the old man in this race. And the other night at that debate was an embarrassment to the Republican voters in America. I mean, even his own consultant staff said to reporters privately without their name, boy, I almost blew it tonight. And then publicly, uh, Trump says, oh, I won 92% of the, of the uh According to polls, I wanted to make everybody knows it was an embarrassment. So let's move on to November 5th, get Harris elected and get this border and other issues under control or advance. Uh, you know, you've given us a lot, a lot to discuss there. Bob, Gary, coming back to you, let's just talk about uh, why Bob says, you know, uh, we haven't seen more border guards during Biden's presidency, saying it's a funding issue, getting bills through Congress, and also saying that he believes that the migrant crisis isn't a dominant issue of this election in some states anyway. What do you say to that? Well, I mean, if we're talking about funding, there, there's been plenty of funding that could have happened, like the 700 billion that we sent to Ukraine. I agree with Bob on one thing. Any Ukrainian man that comes here has to go back to fight for his country because that's, that's, where, that's where he belongs. I agree with him on that. I'm tired of the whole Ukraine thing. I'm tired of sending money to Ukraine. 
All right. I want peace. I want peace over there. That's all I want. Peace everywhere. But um. But no, the, the migrant issue is a real thing. You know, uh, de Democrats want to sweep it under the rug. You know, we got we got the train there, train that Agua, that's terrorizing Colorado. They terrorized Dallas. They they're terrorizing Chicago. They're all over the place. And there were labor union, a uh, uh, railroad labor union gang, that is now here in the United States, and they're and they're vicious. They're they're completely vicious. They've actually got a green light to go after law enforcement. You've got gangs from all other countries coming in as well. I mean, it's a real thing. I don't know why what Bob, why Bob and the Democrats are trying to make it that it's not because this whole thing happened because because they allowed it to happen because we had the safest border under Donald Trump and on day one of the Biden administration they removed Title 42, they removed the Main in Mexico policy, uh, remain in Mexico policy, and it was shut down on day one. You know, so this this everything that happens now falls on them. Look at all the rapes that are happening to these young ladies. You know, Jocelyn. No Justin Nungari, all these other, all these girls that are being viciously raped by Venezuelan gangs, and I'm, you know the Democrats sweep it on. I didn't even hear that. I didn't even hear their names being mentioned the other day at the, at, at the debate. Trump talked about all these rapes that are happening. She wouldn't even say their names. Let's talk about. I, mean, I, I don't know what they're trying. I don't know what they're trying to hide. It's a uh, you know, she's failed at everything she has. She's failed as a border czar. She's failed as a vice president, and to me, she's failing as a presidential candidate. Because, you know, I, I'll, I'll even say Trump could have had a better night the other night at the debate. However, it was three against one. You know, uh, Le Leslie Davis is Kamala's sorority sister. The, 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 one of the executives of ABC, Kamala's best friend. Mm. I mean, it was a three on one. And anybody that saw the debate will admit that. And Bob can't even deny it. Gary, we've been hearing that, that line a lot from people I've been interviewing from the Republican uh, side of the fence in the last few days. And it's a line that's been trotted out again and again. I'm not saying you're just trotting out repeat lines, but three against one, bias and the moderation. Is that because you feel like the debate didn't go well in Trump's favor? No, no. It, 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 it's just from what I saw. The, the, the moderators were fact-checking Donald Trump. Everything he said, they fact-checked him, which, for one, isn't their job. Their job is to moderate the debate. It's not to fact-check him. Um, and they didn't fact-check her. Anything that she said, they didn't fact-check her. They asked Donald Trump, you know, I, I don't remember the exact question, but something to the effect of, you know, people say you're a racist. Why do you say you're a racist? And then they, you know, they went to Kamala and be like, so why do you think he's a racist? It's just a form of the questions. It, you know, I'm not... I'm, I'm, I'm obviously leaning towards Donald Trump. The man changed my life. The man gave me my life back. The man reinstated all my rights where I've been able to continue forward from being in prison for doing my job. But no, it, it, it's, he, he had a three-on-one. It was plain and simple. Anybody that watched the debate can see it. Do you feel like you owe a debt of gratitude to Trump? Then? I mean, I don't know how you voted before, uh, before all this happened, but do you feel like potentially you're biased in Trump's favor because of what he did for you, pardoning you? Well, I'm 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 not going to deny that the man changed my life, and I'm not going to. But I'm also not going to deny that he was the best president that we had. You know, um, the economy was the the economy in the country was the greatest it's ever been. Gas was the cheapest. Uh, crime was lower. Uh, unemployment rates were low. I mean, there's nothing that the man did that you know was wrong. As, as soon as this other administration came in, they changed everything. Gas went through the roof. We got we got wars. We got everything happening. That, you know, they opened the borders. The borders have been a flood. I mean, it's anybody who watches TV can see it. I mean, uh, coming back to you, Bob. Uh, let's let's pick up on Gary's points there. That we have heard from a lot of the Republican camp in previous days uh, following the debate that the moderation was biased. Nobody fact-checked Kamala Harris. Uh, what, what do you say to it? Trump agreed to the debate. Trump is a former president. A former president or a president can dominate any podium that they want. So let's not say the sun was in his eyes. Now on the economy, we've had two presidents in America who left office with fewer jobs than when they entered. One was Herbert Hoover, the Great Depression, and the other was Trump. Trump's last month in office, unemployment was 6.3%, which is 50% higher than it is now. I know the Trump people start repeating what Trump says. Oh, Trump said it. I mean, if Trump said the earth was flat, probably 30% of the Trump supporters would say, yeah, the earth was flat. You know, remember, two-thirds of the American people don't have a passport. So for many of them, it would make sense. 
I'm just tired of the excuses. They got an old man who starts yakking about people eating dogs. He was all over the map in that debate. And even uh, his hardcore supporters, including members of Congress, I saw on TV uh, overnight the next day going, my God, this was a disaster. What the heck? And one Republican said, you know, Trump talked about, oh, the reason all these former cabinet officials don't like him is because he fired them. Or well, his Republican said, here's my suggestion to Trump, fire the people that prepared you for that debate last night or the other night in, in, in today's world. So I think the Republicans got what they wanted, which was Trump. Uh, we may not have any more debates. Harris has offered another one. So far, Trump has said no, but you know, it could still happen. And let's get on with the race, talking about issues that most Americans care about, which is the economy, reproductive rights, and for younger people, one of the biggest issues is climate change. You know, for us older people, we know that the world is going to be changing, floods. I mean, even Vietnam, almost 300 people dead this past week in a typhoon. Uh, but it's really the young people are gonna, that really talk about it, and, and that's their main issue. And if somebody's running for office saying, oh, we're going to keep, we're going to shut down windmills because they produce cancer, most young people say, is this guy uh, living in a nursing home? So I think um, we got a pretty good boost out of that debate the other night. In terms of the sensationalist lines that came out of it, uh, Gary, the, the eating cats and dogs, Haitian immigrants are eating cats and dogs up there in Springfield, a town called Springfield. That line, that was the biggest headline that probably came out of the debate. It went around the world. People were talking about it uh, and asking, you know, is it real? It was fact-checked during the debate. There have been uh, reports afterwards. It seems pretty much everyone in the Trump camp stands by the story. Anybody anti-Trump or against Trump saying, you know, it, it's made up. It's a sensationalist idea. Do you think it was just a distraction, though, from talking about the real migrant issues, potentially attacking Harris on what some say is her weak migrant policy, Gary? Well, she does have a weak migrant policy because, like I said, you know, she keeps talking about when she comes back to the office, she's going to fix it. She's actually in office. And she seems to forget that. But um, the whole the whole migrant thing up in Springfield, Ohio, it's actually happening. Uh, I believe it's happening. If they're eating, if they're eating cats and ducks and geese, you know, there, there have been pictures. Other than what's on the news, I can't I can't verify. However, the governor is sending hundreds of state troopers to Springfield, Ohio, and it's is appointing $2.5 million to help them out with the situations of being overburdened. So something's happening in Springfield, Ohio. Um, something's Bob. really actually happening. Yes, ma'am? But Sorry, I was going to ask Bob, what do you think's happening in Springfield, Ohio? Well, I, I watched the Republican governor of Ohio, Gary mentioned the governor yesterday on TV, said there's no truth to any of this story about people eating eating uh, dogs. Hey, all over America, uh, there's many towns, and I guess Springfield... Ohio is one of them that's had economic problems over the decades, whether it's a steel mill or whatever else left, you know, time has changed. And uh, this particular town, I've seen a lot of uh, people on TV talking about actually the immigrants have increased our population and are actually filling some of the jobs that others won't, and it's actually helpful. <laughs> I'll remind your audience, in America, two women a day are murdered by their husbands or former husband or partner. Uh, we have a bigger problem in America with crime than we have with new migrants, former migrants. And obviously, guns are a big issue. And <laughs> on the Mexican border, unfortunately, guns come from America into Mexico, which are then taken over by the gangs and then used against people, as Gary has pointed out. Oh. Gary, can you and agree with what, to what extent, right. Gary, do you agree with that, that there's bigger uh, issues at play when it comes to crime in America than migrants? Well, like, like you was talking about the towns, towns do have problems and, and, uh, and budgets and constraints and everything. But when you add 20,000 people to a town of 60,000, that's over a third of the population. Like I said, education, fire, EMS, quality of life just goes down the tube. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I don't know what I don't know about his stats, 
Uh, but the thing is, like he was saying, more women were abused by their husbands. You know, I, I don't know the truth about that. However, a lot of these guys are American. So that's the problem that we have to deal with. When it comes to the illegal aliens, they're not supposed to be here. They shouldn't have been here. These, these are things that could have been these are things that could have been avoided to begin with. You know, and when you when you allow over tw you know 20 million to enter without being vetted, when you kick guys out of the uh, service members out of the military for not being vaccinated, and then you allow 20 million people come in unvetted and and unchecked, I mean that that that's there's no checks and balances there. I mean you're 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 setting up a formula for disaster. Look, gentlemen, uh, it's been good debating this with you post-debate, uh, the issue of U.S. migrant crisis. I'm sure we'll be speaking to you again. Bob Mulholland and Gary Brookman, thank you. Coming up, Liv's golf captain and European Ryder Cup legend Ian Poulter joins me for a special interview. Plus, I speak to former National Security Advisor and U.S. Ambassador to the U.N., Ambassador John Bolton, next. From the White House to Gaza, Kiev to Beijing, elections, economics and the environment compete with conflicts and other complex issues for our attention. In an age of fake news, deep fake and artificial intelligence. They've got to have a vote and a say. It's important to look beyond the loudest voice to understand the truth. From newsmakers to groundbreakers. My campaign is going very well. Presidents, prime ministers, princes and peacemakers and cultural tastemakers. As Arabs, as Middle Eastern, we're too emotional. Join me on The Rizkan Khan Show for empowering conversation. I'm joined now by the former National Security Advisor and United States Ambassador to the UN, Ambassador John Bolton. Sir, uh, it's been a couple of days now since the debate. We've had some time to settle it all in. We've got about eight weeks to go until you guys uh, head to the polls to choose the next president. What are your biggest concerns at the moment? Well, I think uh, internationally, the world is in a very dangerous place. And uh, as the debate on Tuesday showed, uh, there wasn't a lot of... Uh, uh, discussion about the challenges that the uh, U.S. faces uh, in the Middle East, in Ukraine, in uh, East Asia with China, and uh, not, not much attention to it and not much specifics from either of the two candidates. So it's a very, very dangerous world out there. And uh, uh, so far in, in this very important election, we just haven't heard enough from the candidates, I think, for the people to make a really informed decision. It is indeed a dangerous world. I was speaking to Leon Panetta just a, a few days ago, who I know is a sort of colleague, peer of yours. And we were talking about the state of things, Ari, China, Russia, Iran, uh, obviously what he sees as threats to the United States and safety and security. If Trump were to re-enter the White House, how would you think relationships with those types of powers would play out over the coming years? Well, I think uh, with respect to Russia and Ukraine, uh, this would be a very favorable development for Vladimir Putin. Uh, Trump was given a chance in the debate to say expressly he favored Ukraine winning the war, this war against Russia's unprovoked aggression, and he wouldn't say it. And I think that tells you all you need to know about which way he would tilt, and it would be very bad for Ukraine. In the Middle East, people think he has uh, more of a record based on his first term, but I can assure you his uh, Trump's anecdotal, ad hoc, transactional approach to uh, everything, including national security affairs, means there's no guarantee that he would behave in the, in the, in the second term as he did in the first. And in an already very dangerous situation with uh, Iran's nuclear weapons program, its uh, obvious use of terrorist proxies uh, throughout the region, uh, that we, we need stability and clear U.S. leadership, not, not the Trump approach. Uh, and in, uh, in Asia, although he's been critical of China for a number of things, uh, I think if Xi Jinping called him up uh, after the election, if, if in fact Trump won and said, uh, Donald, I'm so glad you've been reelected. You know, we've had problems with the U.S., since you departed the White House, let's get together. We can solve them all again. That uh, 
Trump would jump at the opportunity. So I think his policies ultimately would be very risky for the U.S. Uh, if he were elected. You know, I was speaking to Sebastian Gorka, who is a, a strategist to the Trump campaign. You're probably aware of him in an interview yesterday. And he was talking about the fact that when Trump was in office, there wasn't uh, what's currently happening in Gaza, the conflict there. There wasn't the war in Ukraine. And he said, you know, put two and two together. Why do you think that is? Kind of baking that sort of correlation causation argument. What do you say to that? Was Trump the arbiter of peace for the world? No, look, that's that's Trump's standard line, and and uh, he said the war in Ukraine wouldn't have happened if he'd been reelected. The current war in, uh, in the Middle East wouldn't have happened, and on and on. Who knows? It's a statement that's neither provable nor disprovable. Uh, and you know, I think what uh, the Russians were waiting for uh, in the last uh, year and a half of uh, the Trump administration, after the famous phone call with uh, Zelensky was they were waiting through the COVID pandemic and uh, waiting to see what uh, what a second Trump term would look like. But we could have seen a, a easily seen a reprise of what uh, what has already happened. And I, th I think uh, the sa same applies in many other circumstances. Trump simply says what Biden did, I would have done the opposite. And that's uh, hardly a policy and it hardly recognizes there are actually a few things that happen in the world that are not dependent on the United States. Extraordinary to uh, imagine, yeah. I mean, uh, but of course, economic, military superpower, what happens in the US has ramifications elsewhere. Look, you've touched on Russia a fair bit already. Um, talk to me about what's visibly happening in terms of the way that Russia's interacting with this new election, the, the invisible stuff aside. But the supposed endorsement that Putin gave to Harris, what did you make of that? Well, I think that's classic, I would say, communist desinformatia in the Russian word. It's disinformation. It, it allows uh, Trump to say Putin has endorsed my opponent, even though it's pretty clear to me that Putin would love to see Trump reelected. He thinks he's an easy mark. He thinks he can get what he wants from Trump. But he's he's smart enough, obviously, not to say that uh, in open channels. And, and uh, he would like to see Trump. That's, that's what they're trying to do with their covert operations. There, there are a lot of countries, Iran, North Korea, China as well, trying to influence the U.S. election uh, through covert means. It's a very serious threat uh, to our democracy and I think other democracies around the world. And uh, hopefully we're combating them in cyberspace. But I think people in the U.S. and, and really more broadly need to understand that the totalitarian governments of the world uh, are trying to fight an asymmetric war uh, against uh, uh, countries that uh, they want to subvert. But, but look, Trump um, bigs himself up about his relationship with North Korea, with uh, being able to deal with people like Vladimir Putin. Is there anything to that in terms of getting those sort of what are sometimes called strongmen in a room with someone like Trump? Well, you know, Trump uh, says openly that uh, he thinks his personal relations with the head of state, particularly of American adversaries, are uh, an exact description of the state-to-state -state relationships between the United States and that other country, North Korea or whatever. Uh, that's completely wrong. Uh, there's certainly a role for personal relations in international affairs, but these hard men, uh, Putin, Xi, uh, 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 Kim, uh, they, they know what their national interests are, and that's what they pursue. They're not pursuing personal relations. I, I've been in rooms with uh, uh, Trump and all three of them at different times and uh, and, and know them otherwise. Uh, look, I think they believe Trump is a laughing fool uh, and they will take advantage of him accordingly. And that's dangerous for the United States, obviously. Former U.S. National Security Advisor John Bolton, thank you very much for your time. Thanks for having me. I'm now joined by a very special guest, live golf captain and European Ryder Cup legend, of course, himself, Ian Poulter. A pleasure, Ian, to have you on the show. Thanks so much for making time for us there from Chicago. I know you're a busy guy. Um, look, let, let's get straight into it. Talk to me about you playing at the moment. Where are you in the, uh, in the cycle? We are literally two tournaments from the end of the season. We're here in Chicago at Bolingbroke. And uh, looking forward to trying to have a strong end of the season. I think um, 
it would be good for Team Majestics if we can uh, figure this week and then go into, obviously, the uh, team, team Championship next week and try and have a really strong finish. And um, it would help us, I think, uh, you know, leading into the off-season break and, you know, moving into 2025. And we're getting an exciting sort of sense of the activity behind you there at the golf club as well. And, you know, speaking of golf clubs, let's talk about uh, what's happening in the Middle East, because obviously you're with Live Golf now. And it's set to open the 2025 season at the Riyadh uh, Golf Club. Talk to us about uh, what you're expecting from that course. Have you played it before? Uh, how do you see the game growing there? It's very exciting. I think, you know, as you said, our, our first tournament next year is going to be in Riyadh. Uh, I've never played the golf course yet. Uh, it's going to be a new test, I think, for a lot of, a lot of guys. Obviously, the tournaments we've had in the past have uh, been at Royal Greens. So I think for us to experience, you know, what Riyadh has to offer, it will give us, you know, all an opportunity to, to go and spend some time um, in Riyadh and obviously to kickstart 2025 season. I think it's important for Liv uh, for us to be able to, you know, continue to grow the game, go to new territories. Um, Riyadh being one of those destinations, obviously, which I think a lot of us are excited to go to. Um, I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be you know, a great start. Good to hear. I mean, look, it's no sort of secret, it's well publicised that Live Golf and the entry of Live Golf into the golfing scene has sort of disrupted things. Some say in a positive way, others say it's made, you know, some complications. You've got Europe Ryder Cup captain Luke Donald. Um, he's been telling the BBC Team Europe's qualification rules will not actually be changed to accommodate Live Golfers John Rahm, Tyrrell Hatton. Uh, talk to us about your thoughts on that and, and whether anyone's losing out there. Yeah, look, you know, the, the rules that have been set in place um, are difficult. And, you know, Luke being captain of the Ryder Cup and uh, the rules that have been put there in place for, for the guys to try and qualify, um, there's no compromise. So um, I think everyone's aware that, you know, players need to play their minimum amount on the European tour to be able to be eligible to play. Um so it's, it, it's difficult. You know, I, I've played so many Ryder Cups through my years and I've been such a proud member of so many teams. Um, you know, me personally, I find myself in a tricky position where, you know, I'm not a member and I obviously can't become eligible to be, to be part of a team or even help out as a vice captain or captain unless, unless I do become a member again. So, um, look, it's not, it's not the best scenario, but it's one that, um, the tour is sticking to and we'll see how things move uh, and progress as, as things go. And, you know, in terms of where you see yourself then in the next few years as you're working with Liv and seeing it sort of grow, especially in the Middle East region, I mean, what, what are your hopes for the next coming years? The hopes for Liv's, Liv's growth, I think what we've done in a short period of time uh, with the Liv, Liv product being more global, uh, taking it to new territories, uh, showing and growing the fan base and actually reducing uh, the actual demographic age of, of followers that, that we now have within Goal is something that's very exciting. So, you know, for us to go to Australia, Hong Kong, Singapore, uh, Korea, we've been Thailand, you know, for, you know, all the territories, the Middle East, everywhere we're going, we're, we're gaining you know, a lot of good fans. So I think each individual franchise has the ability to tap into all of all of the fan base that's out there following us um, and bringing that younger, that younger age group into the game of golf. I think that's, that's the most exciting piece, I think, for us is we've dropped that age from, a, from a, an age of a 64-year-old down to, down to 40-year-old. So um, that's a good thing. I think it's a good thing for the fan base. It's a good thing for us. Uh, and I'm really excited about the, the, the franchise future. Well, talking about uh, young people getting into sport, then your son, Luke, very much following in your footsteps. So we hear, I mean, how's, how's he getting on? Luke's doing really good. Um, unfortunately, he picked up a little bit of a lower back mm. uh, stress fracture in May this year. So he's had, a, he's had three months off, but uh, he's rehabbed really well and he's back chipping. He'll be back hitting some shots uh, next week and 
uh, he's rested and ready to go. So he's he's really keen. He's really eager, um, and his growth within the game is very exciting for me as a as a dad um, and a proud dad to be able to be in a position to help him and want to see him develop into you know hopefully you know an incredible golfer and if one day he could be part of Team Majestics, that would be uh, that would be simply amazing. Good lad. Uh, it sounds like he's getting on well despite that injury. Look, in terms of the stress of the sport, the pressures of it, something that was well documented, I think, in that Netflix documentary, Full Swing, you featured in. Um, talk to us about how difficult it is to qualify for majors these days. And do you have concerns for your son then? Yeah, look, the, the, the system that we have in place right now, you know, the, the OWGR, Official World Golf Ranking System, is really the only criteria to be able to get into these majors. Um, in live, we don't have world ranking points and obviously that's, that's tricky. So, you know, you will see fewer guys, unfortunately on live at the minute that are eligible to play in those majors. So it's, it's up to those, those majors themselves to be able to enhance their product and actually see the vision of who do we want to see play golf? Do we want the best players in the world playing golf in our tournament? Or do they not? So at some stage, I think, you know, common sense will prevail and they would like to see, A, the personalities within the game and the best players in the world all competing together. Um, each month that goes past, you know, we lose another top-ranked player who falls outside of that top 50. And that's obviously difficult, I think, for their product. So moving forward, um, you know, you just have to be able to qualify for world ranking points to see that happen until things change. So I'm very hopeful things will change moving forward and that will give obviously certainly players on live and the great players that we all know that should be in the top 50 in the world, um, you know, to, to, to gain their spot back with inside the majors. Uh, I want to come back to some of the, the lifestyle stuff um, eventually because I think you've got a lot to say outside of golf. But just staying with it because you mentioned some of those uh, names there within the sport. Let's let's get your view. Do you think we're ever going to see Rory McIlroy win the Masters or even another major? But R Rory is one of the best players in the world. He has been he has been now for for a very long time. He's been one of the most consistent golfers within the game over a long period of time. Um, and yeah, he hasn't, you know, he hasn't won that 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 major now for for a long time, and I'm sure it's hurting him as much as um, it's hurting all of his fans that want want him to win another one. So, look, Rory Rory's working tirelessly hard to uh, to get another major, and I'm sure he will. Like he's he's a world class player. He missed out, unfortunately, you know, this year uh, to Bryson. But, um, you know, he's, he's a great watch. People tune in to watch Rory play golf. And that's, that's the exciting thing about, about golf right now. We have so many great players that have the opportunity to win majors, most of which play in the majors and some that don't. Some that don't, indeed. I mean, uh, let's talk about someone, though, like Scotty Scheffler. Talk to us about his form, you know, how many majors you see him winning. Could he, could he get there? Could he challenge the likes of Tiger Woods one day? Um, could Scotty Scheffler challenge Tiger Woods' record? Uh, if, if he carries on in the form he's in today, then, you know, quite clearly he, he would be able to do so. Um, you know, we see purple patches through players in the past. We see players that get to world number one. Um, and in the last decade, we've seen a number of world number one golfers change and fight for that spot. So um, I don't think we've, we've seen a player to date that has held that number one spot. Anything close to the, the amount of time that Tiger Woods has held that spot. So I'm not sure... I'm not sure we'll see Scotty reach that target. He has potential if he carries on on the, on the trend that he's on right now because at the minute he's untouchable. Uh, yeah, untouchable is, is a way of putting it. Look, you are one of the greats, Ian. Um, you know, as a fellow Brit, I'm extraordinarily proud to uh, count you amongst the sports people of the United Kingdom. And you have been great throughout your career. 
We've talked a little bit already about the way you've taken your career through Live and, you know, uh, what you think of uh, being, you know, one of those legendary rider people. Could you, do you ever see yourself actually being able to become uh, Europe Ryder Cup captain? Is that something you'd still want to achieve? No, I, it, it goes without saying that if you cut me in half, um, you know, in there's like a stick of rock that says Ryder Cup. I, I, I've been part of so many Ryder Cups. It's been, it's been a huge part of, my golf in life it's some of the most proudest moments of my career um which you you would have seen at medina just down the road from where we are right now um so you know i i'm hopeful one day there's a there, there's a sense of coming together that would enable the likes of myself but not but but you know not just myself but lee westwood henrik stenson that the Ryder cup was taken away from Graham McDowell, um, Martin Keimer, um, Sergio Garcia, you know, all those guys that have, that have spent probably somewhat 40 Ryder Cups of experience um, between them, you know, the opportunity to be able to be captain because as it stands today, that that's, that's not going to happen. Um, but look, I, I would love that opportunity. I would love to lead a team out. So let's see what happens. Um, you know, there's uh, there's going to need to be some compromise for that to happen. So I'm, I'm touch wood, hopeful one day we'll see it. Uh, what is it? What are the things, because we've spoken a bit about the differences in the tournaments and the different, uh, what, what Liv is doing differently, but what is it about the DP World Tour and PGA Tour that you miss? What do I miss about PGA Tour, European Tour? Uh, just a few friends, that's it. Mm. Um, I think I'm, you know, I've played a lot of golf on, on both of those tours and, you know, upwards of 600 events, I would say. And, you know, the guys have, have and, you know, will always have a very strong product. And, you know, for me, for me, the live product has been very refreshing to be in a team environment and have teammates that I have the opportunity to play with week in, week out. That for me is, is amazing. And, and to be able to grow this franchise, I think people lose the sense of what franchise really means and, and the team value and what I miss about, you know, the European tour, the Ryder Cup, for instance, I get on a weekly basis for the 14 weeks that I play here on live. So, um, with what I missed there, I actually gain, I gain all of it back on this side. So, um, yeah. Sounds, uh, sounds like it all sort of balances out somewhat. I mean, look, let's talk about um, some of your favourite moments in, in your career so far. What do you reckon is the best golf shot you've ever made? You know, I, it, it's hard to look past Medina and you know, holding that part on Saturday afternoon. I think for me to have been in that position uh, with having teammates there at the right time for you to be able to um, energize the team and create a little bit of magic. I think, you know, um, we've had a few of those moments in the Ryder Cups and, and, and they're the things I think that, that, that really means so much to me. Let's talk about then some of the challenges, the challenges of the type of career that you have had, that you've chosen, that you've now uh, allowed your son <laughs> to get into as well. And you spoke about some of this on the Netflix show, you know, the pressures, the gruelling tournaments, the qualifying stress, um, time away from family. Uh, what has been the biggest challenge for you? I think the biggest challenge, I think the biggest challenge over my 25 years on tour would be um, the time away from the children. Mm. And I think that is, um, that is very difficult. I think, you know, being away from home for 30 weeks a year, missing nativity plays, missing, you know, key milestones in their growth and their life um, is something I've had to live through via um, FaceTime or text message or, you know, I, I, I can never get those moments back. So, you know, for me, for me, it's I have to try and put that to one side in the back of my mind and just 
really focus on, you know, creating a great, a great environment to be able to bring the kids up in. So lean very much on Katie, my wife, who's done an incredible job for all those years, bringing the kids up. And, you know, family is the one thing that, that, you know, re really kind of brings it home to me is um, that time, time with the family is so special. And and you've again, uh, you know, talking a lot about Luke here, but you've encouraged your son to enter the sport, so you don't have the same concerns for him. Do you think people manage the golf life balance better these days? Do you think there's support? It's it's never easy to manage. So you know, Luke, Luke is finding out now. Obviously, being at college, he's been at college for for, for three years, and um, you know, it's it's demanding. But if if that is a passion that he has, and I've definitely seen it from within him, that he would like to go on this journey of, um, albeit quite quite a lonely quite a lonely job, um, but you know it's something that he loves. And for me to be able to see one of your kids enjoy something, and actually get you know get a lot of sat satisfaction from from working very very hard, uh, it's rewarding as a parent. I think you know first and foremost and you know I'm lucky to be able to have a, a bit of a support system there to a give him some knowledge that perhaps some others probably don't have so he has a, a little bit of advantage there but try and help him with the stresses and the difficulties that will always come with that and you know I, I'd like Luke to become Luke and not Ian's son um, and that's probably one of the biggest challenges that we'll, we'll always have to overcome. Let's let's talk a little bit about you uh, as a personality. You know, you're very famous for your colourful outfits, your boisterous personality on on the golf course, as it's been called. Uh, you know, you were playing it down in a blue shirt today, Ian, but I can see there's probably some socks in there. Sorry, sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let, let's talk about um, social media because you have got a huge fan base, uh, huge exposure there. You were a pioneer quite early on on Twitter, which is now X, of course. How do you feel about the way social media has developed? developed and your role in it social media has been good and bad mm. i think um like we're probably all you know anyone that uses it kind of feels that um you know it's definitely changed over the years and um you know it's it's it has its ups and it it, it definitely has its downs you can find yourself burning way too much time on it but yet you can keep up to speed with everybody that you like in 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 all in all walks of life, whether it just be friends or whether it's somebody you follow or a team, um, but also you can in, interconnect with your fans more. And obviously, when I first started playing golf, there wasn't that. You had to kind of interact with your fans at tournaments, and now we can do that on a daily a daily basis given given really your fans an inside look of what what goes on within your life so um i do think it's very important to be able to to give the fans what they want but also i think it's really important to to manage from a parent's perspective the amount of exposure that social media um gives to your kids because it, you you can find yourself going down a down a deep dark path sometimes uh and it's concerning so mm. the good and the bad of social media is uh is right there in front of us all and i know as a professional sportsman you probably uh, like to stay away from politics so don't worry i'm not going to ask your your, your political <laughs> opinions on things but look um x and social media users uh it ended up in a bit of a a, a nasty situation back in the uk this was a few weeks ago now with race riots on the streets and things a lot of public disorder a lot of it was based on disinformation on social media as an englishman abroad how did you feel about that as I say, it has its ups and downs, um, and it's concerning. So I, you know, I I fall into the the channels of of someone that gets concerned when you obviously hear stuff on social media, and you just have to be careful of of, of what to believe because it's very easy for channels and people to be able to push stuff out there um, which can sway your mind, and that that's the dangers of social media you just have to you have to understand what is what is factual what isn't factual uh and try not to get 
try not to get suckered in. So it's, um, it has to be dealt with carefully for sure. In terms of uh, keeping your feet on the ground, just generally, Ian, um, you know, for somebody who's had so much success, so much fame, um, wealth assuming to go with it as well, how do you, how do you stay so normal? Um, I, you know, I, I don't think I've changed. I've, I've, mm. I've kept the same kind of group of friends. I've kept the same management system. I've kept good people around me. So um, there's, there's not really much chance that, you know, I can get too, too carried away from that without somebody obviously giving me a clip around the ear or, or telling me I'm saying or doing something wrong. So I think it's, um, it's all about the people that you have around you uh, the support system you have, the friends that you have, um, and making sure you know, making sure you you make the right choices and you do the right things. Just rounding things up. I mean, how how strong are you feeling these days? How many more years do we get to watch the spectacle of you playing golf? <laughs> Look, I, I I'm working harder than I've ever worked before. So with playing 14 weeks a year as opposed to 28, I have more time to work on my fitness. That's something that's, that's now quite important to me to be able to be in the best possible shape I can be to play golf. So I'm, I'm hopeful we can go a few more years playing, but uh, we'll have to wait and see. And if, if that doesn't work out that I can keep playing for, for many, many more years, the, the nice thing with Live Golf is that I have a franchise that I believe in. I have a franchise and a team of people that I can work with to be able to continue to grow the game of golf to be able to give back within inside the game of golf um, and have a great successful business on the back end to enjoy and still be part of, uh, of this great game. Fantastic stuff. Look, golfing legend Ian Poulter, it's been a pleasure having you on the show. Thanks for having me. That is all we have time for on Global News today. Thank you for watching. Be sure to join us again on Monday for more exclusive interviews and debate. Until then, goodbye.